Good morning. This is the morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on um, March 31st. And we're pleased to um, have as a guest this morning uh, Seth Leonard, who is with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And as members know, but Mr. Leonard, when we are doing the budget, we are on such a, a sprint that we can, it is hard for us to take the time to pause and really understand programs. And, and so that's what we're hoping in, that you can help us with now that we're not sprinting. So we're, as you noted, we're kind of walking and sitting and um, just help us understand the uh, proposal for the so-called missing middle and what it will accomplish, how, you know, the, the ins and outs of that. So I turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's an honor um, and can't start without um, sharing deep gratitude and appreciation for all that you have um, done on an annual basis for the state of Vermont. But I know especially right now your jobs have been especially difficult. So thanks for all of your hard work. Um, and um, just to go through um, who I am again, my name is Seth Leonard, I'm Managing Director of Community Development for Vermont Housing Finance Agency. I manage our um, lending programs on the multifamily and single family development side, also our asset management and compliance and our research um, and communications and um, community relations departments as well. Uh, I have slides that I shared with the committee and I understand that you all prefer just to pull them up yourselves or look at printouts instead of me sharing screens. And to go through all those would be about 30 minutes. Is that is that an okay time frame, or would you prefer me to condense that down to allow for additional discussion with the window you have? No, 30 minutes is fine, and um, we'll try to let you get through it, and then we'll hold, hold some time for questions after. Okay, great. And um, am I right that I will not share screen, right? You all have a Correct. copy of the slides. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we prefer to see you. We all have our devices, and I I pulled up and I see a couple of my colleagues. First, BHFA building access to home ownership. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I'll reference a few graphs so that that's helpful if you have that handy. Yeah. Um. So thank you very much. So I think um, most presentations and discussions usually end with resources and research, but I think a really important part of um, understanding this proposal is knowing that there has been a lot of work and time and thought put into um, and policy development conversations that support a number of the items in S226. And many of the solutions and ideas didn't come out of um, thin, air, the, thin air. They were from measured pressures that we've seen in the housing market and from measured need that we've seen in the housing market for um, some time. So you've got a list of those research um, pieces and slides and hopefully links to them, but um, you'll see at the top is a housing needs assessment link um, that told us before the pandemic set in in Vermont, um, we had 90,000 Vermont renter and homeowner households who were paying more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Um, that's what we would call cost burden households. And that 39,000 of those households or 16% of all Vermonters were paying more than 50% of their housing costs. Um, so we had an affordability issue prior to the pandemic that's been exacerbated by the conditions um, inspired by the pandemic. You see a link to a cost study that we um, performed in 2019 and released in early 22 um, pre-pandemic again, that highlighted that as a state, we were already seeing tr tremendous pressures on our housing community development fields from a well-defined combination of um, permitting regulatory and process barriers. Yes, that's part of the, so part of the um, feedback you'll hear from builders and developers in terms of why we aren't maybe reaching our housing uh, building and development goals, um, but there were already also emerging labor and material costs, which we'll spend a, a good amount of time today talking about as well. And then a two 2021 report um, that focused on um, land use regulations at a local level uh, where we had 22 of 69 responding towns indicate that they don't have uh, zoning less than a half acre um, for a lot sizes anywhere in their community, which is uh, speaks to the, the challenges of sometimes placing the 
the right homes in the right places, as we like to say, to be sure that we're doing responsible um, growth and development. And then you have a 2021 report called the State of Development in Vermont. And if you have time to read one, I think for, for this conversation, this is a particularly helpful one. And a lot of the slides and discussion today in this program are really a continuation of discussing what that paper is pointing out, which is in the housing development field, we've really run into a perfect storm of um, chronic uh, lack of meeting our production goals or um, our inability to produce enough housing units as a state, along with pressures created by the pandemic uh, related to cost and, and labor especially. And those, those things all build and compound off of each other. Um, and it's made, it's made the challenge now, a lot of people are rightfully calling it a crisis. So, um, and, and just a quick plug to uh, the timeless resource in all of this, uh, research ages, but housingdata.org does not. So if you aren't using that site, it's a great place to see latest and grace in terms of research, housing data and information. Um, the next thing I want to point out is just a little, a, a list of, of the existing programs to help home buyers. So if you're following along at home, that'd be that next slide three. Um, which is a list of the various resources we have available. In Vermont, we have about $60 million in a given year. After we convert all the federal and state tax credits into equity, we have about $60 million to spend on affordable housing. And right now, um, we spend between 1.9 and 2.9 million of those dollars on single family investments as a state. So um, you can see the overwhelming uh, number of investments go towards uh, multifamily um, housing development. And primarily, our, the majority of our resources for single family have gone towards down payment assistance, which I would qualify as being a demand side thing, helping people compete in the existing housing market. And that's important because what the missing middle proposal really is, is it's trying to change the market a little bit. It's, it's We're trying to um, increase the inventory of homes available to buy uh, to make those borrowers who might otherwise uh, be totally reliant on down payment assistance, um, more competitive in that environment. So as you walk through those various programs that this state has done, it's also worth noting that um, at various times that our states um, faced either economic or uh, environmental crises, we have invested one time state or federal funds um, or increased our programming for housing investments as a result of those uh, those well, crises of the past. Um, this, the uh, state tax credit program is probably the most recognizable to folks, the state's investment in affordable housing tax credits that is paired in some cases uh, for multifamily projects with the federal 4% 4, 4 low income housing tax credit for multifamily rental developments, but also has the home ownership portion, which over its history has created $14 million in, in state tax credit tax credit equity that's gone towards home ownership and VHFA manages that program. And it's included over $6.6 .6 million in stick built homes. Um, remembering that a portion of those state credits also go towards down payment assistance and also support uh, a manufactured home replacement program out of that state credit pool. That credit pool has consistently been increased um, in response to various crises, including Hurricane Irene, probably most, um, most recently when a large boost was done for the program. In 2008, we used the federal uh, funding programs called HARP um, to make investments in 74 homes that were purchased and rehabbed across the state, similar to the VHIP program, honestly, that you uh, have also probably had some inter interactions with in some cases. Um, but that program was extremely successful, good example of using that the federal relief for that type of program. And I mentioned too, you'll see a slide um, if you're following along again, number six, that talks about our response to um, hurricane or tropical storm, excuse me, Irene, um, and the fact that since that one time in, uh, increase in the investment that we had in state tax credits has been enacted, we've been able to replace 263 manufactured homes across the state um, that are owner occupied. So that's a tremendous achievement from that program and it's had a really sustained benefit to Vermonters. In some cases, making sure people are getting out of floodways and environmentally hazardous situations. And in some cases, just um, replacing dilapidated homes that otherwise would not, not be safe and fit to live in and otherwise would not get replaced. We've also invested um, as, as an agency and as a state in preservation of manufactured home communities where possible. Manufactured home communities are the largest source of un traditionally unsubsidized housing in our country, um, and Vermont's no different. Um, 
you would end up with over 7,000 uh, uh, people. If you combine all the manufactured home communities in the state, it would rank as one of our larger towns or municipalities. Um, and it's been an important part of our home ownership investment portfolio. And then traditionally VHFA's participated in over $18 million in home ownership construction. Now, if I compare that to what we've done on the multifamily side, um, we do $18 million in construction lending in a year on multifamily, but uh, there is a pattern history of our investments in that area to try to inspire uh, single family investment, single family home development. But by and large, in comparison, especially to the rental side of things, it's it's been pretty low in terms of what we've invested for home ownership in the state. Um, and again, um, if you're following along, slide nine shows, points out that the single family um, down payment assistance program has now helped over 1300 Vermonters uh, since 2015. And that's probably been also the bailiwick program for the state in terms of what we've relied on to really support Vermonters in accessing affordable home ownership. One thing that's been really clear that we haven't moved the needle effectively on, if you're following along again, slide 10, is um, this frustrating <laughs> graph that shows you our, our current breakdown of home ownership rates by race. Um, and white alone households um, experience a 72% home ownership rate, while black or African American households in Vermont are experiencing a 24% um, ownership rate. This is at a time where our country just shattered the record for what we would call tappable home equity. There's $9.9 .9 trillion in homes in tappable equity across the country. So if you think about um, the fact that home ownership in our country, right, wrong, you know, don't agree with it myself that it's the vehicle for wealth and, and generational transference of resources, but there is a reality that it is. Um, and it provides stability from a financial standpoint um, for a lot of families. And when you see this kind of imbalance in the percentage of home ownership between, um, between races, that's, that's extremely um, concerning because that means that 24% uh, uh, of households versus 72% um, for, for um, Black and African American families um, aren't getting access to something that as a country accounts for about 30% of the total wealth that households have. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a disturbing trend and one that we think inventory has a lot to do with um, and availability and opportunities for purchasing. When we do focus on demand side and we send borrowers into the market for, um, to participate, we need to also be aware of what the market's doing. And the next few slides walk you through what we're seeing. As a country, we just crossed $400,000 for the, at the median home sales price. Vermont's not quite there yet, but we are on our way. Um, so the first graph here shows you a little bit that um, the prices have climbed precipitously. So prior to the pandemic, we were experiencing uh, medium home price increases of about two to 3%. But from 20, 2020 to 2021, we jumped up to 10%. And now over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, the price points for homes have jumped up 19%. Um, and I think we would all agree that the household incomes of Vermonters have not done the same thing. Um, so home, home price doesn't exactly match up with household growth observed in, and census data in other areas. So Chittenden County, for example, has the highest prices, median prices uh, between $385,000 for a single family home and $425,000 for a single family home. Um, meanwhile, the, in the Northeast Kingdom, Caledonia, Essex, and Orleans, we we still have median um, sales prices around 153, uh, but we're seeing new growth. It's been really um, interesting to see because traditionally, if you look at slide number 12, um, we would see a, a real imbalance across the state and where we see home price growth. Um, but what this is showing you is actually the cost increases that have been experienced um, in the graph where it shows you where home prices are going has been statewide. It's not been located to a couple markets and it's popped up in some really interesting places that um, would be hard to predict. And there is certainly, um, uh, you know, some of the recreation and tourism sites like Minden, Dover, Ludlow and Warren uh, are high up on that list. But there's also been in increases that have been um, really, we'd say, out of whack in places like Addison, Barrie, and North Hero. 
um, where there aren't as high a percentage of second homes or uh, seasonal or vacation homes. So that's been um, interesting to watch. And we would argue has a lot to do with slide 13 about um, home, home construction and our inability to really um, add enough units. Uh, Vermont's projected home, um, home growth uh, between 2025, according to the housing needs assessment, was projected to be about 0.18%. That's um, well over a percent lower than where we have been in the past um, and is really near stagnation. And that, that accounts for homes that are aging. We have the second oldest housing stock in the country and going off the market in addition to just the inability to build enough new homes. So, you know, we're losing a certain number of homes because we have a whole uh, older housing stock and not adding enough new. Um, and the call it encouraging if you want. Um, I was on a call yesterday with the other housing finance agencies across the country and heard that um, right now there are uh, accounted for proposals across the country to spend about $2 billion of um, state and local fiscal recovery dollars on housing efforts across the country. Um, you all in Vermont have been leaders. Um, we've been leaders on um, making sure that we prioritize those investments, but um, there's a lot of discussion about how to get at the home ownership um, piece of things as well. We obviously work a lot on rental, but um, we're really interested in this. Um, and there's been a thawing for, from the federal level about uh, the worthiness of these investments too. And so when we approached the home ownership program development, um, we thought uh, looking at the federal proposal called the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act was a really great place to start. And you've got a couple slides that break down the way that that program looks. The Neighborhood Home Investment Act is essentially uh, matching up home ownership investments to the way low-income housing tax credits work on the rental side of things. So you probably have all heard about the 9% or 4% low-income housing tax credits for rental developments, our largest pool of resources year over year that we have in non-pandemic ARPA and one-time spending times um, to develop uh, multifamily housing. And this would replicate that, but provide funding for single-family home development. We really focused on how we could prepare for that program and build something that would prepare our state to take it on should it pass. It was part of Build Back Better. It's really hard to say what's gonna happen with that federal program, but we still think it's really smart to model any kind of state investments in home ownership to something that will translate easily to that. Because if you think about it, we won't be standing up a brand new program if this federal opportunity passes, uh, which we think will provide about $8 million or so every year to the state in terms of funding to support single family housing. So we thought about preparing for that. We wanted to increase opportunities specifically for households below 120% AMI. Typically our home ownership programs have focused more at the 80% level of ownership and sometimes lower. So that was a little higher, but maps to what the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act on the federal side was seeking to achieve too. We want to support large and smaller scale developments that could meet needs across the state. We can't build a hundred new homes in every community, but there are a lot of projects out there that need help and would like to add some affordable units um, that are four, five, and six, and good fits for their community. Um, and we would like to be able to scale a program that's easy enough and has few enough administrative barriers to be able to reach those um, homes to, or those communities as well. And that's about that creation of accessibility too. So the high points on the Neighborhood Home Investment Act what is basically that the, the federal program would create funds where we could subsidize up to 35% of the construction cost of either building a new home or acquisition rehabilitation of a home. So that would mean a builder on the acquisition rehabilitation side could buy a home that's in disrepair, repair it and then sell it back. And the subsidy would help both take on the repairs and also ensure that it was sold for a more affordable price than what we're seeing in the market right now. That particular program um, set is targeting households up to 140% AMI, area median income. And I'll show you what the prices look like in a second for that. Sorry to use jargon and have an acronym on there. Um, but we have said 120 has felt better from a priority standpoint for the state and matches a lot of other programming that we do. There are some geographic limitations on the <laughs> Neighborhood Home Development Act proposal on the federal side that we're not big fans of. And we've been working with our congressional district our, uh, delegation to be sure that, um, that those get changed or fixed to meet uh, rural states. 
Uh, but the nice thing about what we're proposing with the state funds, the missing middle proposal, is there is no geographic limitation for us other than making sure we build in smart places, responsible growth, um, and spread it across the state to the, our, the best of our ability. And then this is a big topic when it comes to this subject, which is how is the subsidy retained? If there's a state or federal resource going into a home, what's our expectation in terms of its future affordability and what's going to happen to that subsidy? For the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, it's pretty loose. There's a reduction in the amount of uh, required recapture from, a, from the appreciation. In other words, the gain that a borrower might realize um, and that the home's value um, as it increases over time, um, that they don't receive a full windfall of it in the beginning, but it reduces over time how much equity they get to take with them from that appreciation. They get full access to the equity um, I want to say that in this in the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, the sweat equity. So if you've paid your mortgage down, blank number, um, you realize all all of that um, equity. But if there's an appreciation increase in the cost, there's a calculation in that federal program that restricts that. So we took all that information, that housing data, kind of where we had been as a state, and that Neighborhood Homes Investment Act information and put together the missing middle program. And it focused again on that same benchmark number of not exceeding 35% of total development costs for a home to buy it down um, to allow uh, purchases to occur for, uh, for households affordable at 120% AMI. Again, I'll show you what that number looks like in just a moment. It's based off of two stages of, of um, subsidy being needed. The first is called the value gap. The value gap is the difference between what it costs to build a home right now and the appraised value. You've probably seen some news stories from what it looks like to build a home right now. Um, when builders are even building modest homes um, and, and at, with their best building methodologies possible right now, given where costs are from labor and materials in particular, they cannot build a home for what it will appraise for. It costs too much. Um, so what would happen with the program is it would first address that value gap and fill the difference between what it costs to build a modest home and what its actual value is. So that really level sets the builder from the beginning to the marketplace so they're not overinflating the price on that home further by selling it for what it actually costs them to build. And in many cases, it would actually map back to what it's worth um, and what its value is. The second is an affordability gap, which is to say that despite where appraisals are right now, um, that's still not affordable because of the lack of inventory and where we're seeing prices occur. So what is happening is transactions are getting cash only buyers multiple bids and they're going way above their appraised value for sales too, right? And as a result, the markets kept pushing those home values up and up. So what we've said is in addition to getting to that appraised value, there would be an affordability gap that will allow the the program to provide a subsidy that would further push the value or purchase price of the home down to that number that's affordable to somebody at 120% AMI. So that value gap will get a modest home down to its appraised value. That appraised value still may not be affordable to somebody at 120% AMI. The affordability gap would step in as a secondary resource. The affordability gap, what we've said, would then be retained in the home as a permanent subsidy and would buy down the price for future buyers. There is, in, in the Senate side of things, there was a little discussion um, or quite a bit of discussion about, you know, should there be an option for the buyer to be able to pay that subsidy back instead of have it pass on to the next buyer? Should we require the next buyer to have, um, a, the next buyer to be income qualified? And those are all things that um, there were questions about on the Senate side of things. What's proposed um, is that the subsidy remain in the home, make the home affordable for future buyers. And I'll show you some math on that too. It layers well with existing programs. It does not require um, on face the use of the exact model of shared equity that we've historically used and supported with the state tax credit program. It is opening up the opportunity for different solutions or multiple, multiple solutions. The shared equity program can sometimes struggle and in other areas of the state outside of um, Chittenden County. And we would really like to see the opportunity for builders, nonprofit and for-profit in those areas to try other approaches and other calculation methodologies when they try to think how to make homes affordable into the future. 
There's a second portion of this program, which is a construction access, capital access program. I actually don't want to spend a lot of time on this today because I think it can, it can confuse it a little bit. But I wanted to just note that as we talk to builders and developers, one of the things they cheered for was also help us on the construction side because getting upfront capital will help us build more homes. And so we've partnered with Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to create a $2 million pool that will provide construction guarantees to Vermont banks and credit unions who are making loans to home builders that will uh, reduce some of the cash that they have to set aside as security when they start their projects and also increase the amount that they can borrow because it'll provide a, a credit enhancement of sorts to their construction loans so that maybe they can add a couple more homes to the projects that they're working on. And those, those homes that um, that uh, program applies to have to be um, program eligible. So in terms of eligible homes for what's being proposed, it's single family homes. Single family homes though can contain between one and four units as long as it's owner occupied. It can be a condominium unit, a house or apartment or a cooperative. So one thing to note is it could be a percentage. If you're building six homes, you don't have to use the program for all six homes. You could have four market rate homes and, and include two program homes. So the subsidy would only assist you with those two homes. And same thing in a condo development. And that's a pretty great tool when you think about the fact that there are a lot of municipal municipalities across the state that have asked builders to build a certain percentage of their homes at an affordable price, but aren't actually providing them any kind of financial resources to get there. Um, and that can sometimes cause the other homes around there to bear the cost of those affordable units and just drive their prices up even more, which isn't a great formula. Um, the eligible costs can include land acquisition, pretty much every hard construction cost you can think of, and a lot of the soft costs um, associated with um, the development of single family homes. The affordability levels I talked about um, are posted on our website. Um, we have an affordability chart. This is actually what's used for other state programs when you talk about reaching affordability levels too. And I have a little arrow there because we think that that's really the, so the sweet spot statewide for the program. So you can think about what that looks like. Um, and it's getting those homes available at the 319, 500 um, to 255, 500 range outside of uh, Chittenden County. And then within Chittenden County, um, that 100% AMI level is where we think the sweet spot is for the program. So. Um, you know, we fund projects right now with state tax credits um, that sometimes uh, the units will cost, you know, close to $400,000 in some cases to build, um, but the final sales price to the borrower is $170,000, $180,000. That's pretty <coughs> typical for our program right now. This would not go that deep um, on face. However, when this program steps in and gets that sales price down to 319,500, it could be layered with other traditional resources from Vermont Housing and Conservation Board or from VHFA if a developer decided to do that and wanted to layer in those resources and reach deeper. So we think it's a great tool to get home affordability down to 120, 100% AMI. And then there are programs that will drive it down even lower, especially to hit those 80% AMI levels. Um, so that's the, that's the target in terms of uh, where we think the sweet spot is and where we think the real need is. We have built priorities around this program that have talked about how we're going to, and um, we've built underwriting guidelines and resources internally, but these program priorities stand tall in terms of how we would analyze projects and give you a good sense if you're following alongside 20 and 21 especially. So project location, again, geographic dis distribution, I talked a little bit about. Um, we are um, not interested in this being a sprawl program. We wanna make sure that it's thoughtful where the homes are going. Um, we wanna ensure that homes are modest. It's not to build uh, large homes, which right now in this marketplace, that's where builders are being pushed to right now. Um, and a lot of builders have said, I don't like building the stuff I'm being asked to build right now. I wanna build stuff like this and this could help me do that. Um, deeper affordability will be um, will be considered as will energy efficiency in the development. And, and if there's a historic uh, nature of the project too, which we do have some buildings that could possibly do that. Um, the program guidelines include construction costs, size, limitations, and profit limits for builders. Um, and those are all part of um, a standard review of a project. So there are there are guard guardrails um, on this and 
Um, the uh, numbers that we're going to be using for that uh, will use the survey data from the National Home Builders Association, along with what we compile about what a modest home looks like in Vermont and what's appropriate um, for different size bedrooms and um, households. So I talked a, a good bit about the subsidy definitions, but wanted to provide a slide there for you. So, um, because I think that's helpful, that value gap, think about it as the difference between the cost to build the home and the appraised value. The affordability gap is, okay, you've got the appraised market value, but that still may not be affordable to those households we're trying to reach. So let's subtract off the affordable sales price for that target median income. And then that subsidy retention would be um, either repaid or reduced um, to the next, the next buyers from a price perspective. Um, and so the way the mechanics of it work in the subsidy example, I've got both a new construction and an acquisition rehab there for you to see. If you had a 400,000 uh, home that cost $400,000 to build, um, and I gotta, gotta tell you right now, that's that sounding pretty good in terms of uh, cost because it's it's really hairy out there when it comes to looking at cost. Uh, but cost to, to build a home $400,000, if the appraised market value were $375,000, if appraisal said that's what the home's worth, the value gap would be $25,000. And then if we looked at our chart and said, we wanna reach that 100 to 120% AMI level, that means we're gonna to need to get that home down to 319, 500. And that, that says our affordability gap subsidy would be around 55,500. And just to say this aloud, this very closely models a, a very real development that we did um, in Woodstock um, uh, just this year, building some homeownership units. So it's very close to that in terms of the numbers. And then the final pr price and sales subsidy um, total from the program would be 80,500, 80, but it's that 55,500 that would be passed on to that next buyer that would reduce that number. So the buyer would um, get an appraisal, uh, or excuse me, the seller would get an appraisal if they decide to sell the home in the future. And we would subtract that 55,500 from that appraisal and say that's the maximum sales price. That's what's being proposed in the program. I do want to note that the Senate included language um, referencing AMI for future households. And that's where what we will probably ask for is an opportunity to have to say the seller will either, either um, offer it for sale to reach the AMI level that they bought it from. So whatever that sales price is at the time, our chart will adjust or pay the subsidy back so we can spin it in another home. Um, but that's that's a piece that's going to need to get ironed out as it's moved over to the House in terms of some of the language that came in last minute from the Senate. Um, and this was an acquisition rehab example on there too, if you're following along on slide 24, which is if you bought a, a home that was in disrepair for $220,000, and this is really for builders to buy the home, not for an individual to take on that responsibility themselves, and it cost $180,000 um, to rehab the home. The value gap again, because their the appraised value would come in at 375 would be $25,000 and the affordable subsidy would be 55,500. So those numbers all look the same. It's just showing that instead of the new construction costs equal $400,000, if you combine the cost to buy the home with rehabilitation, um, it's got the opportunity to help bring um, homes online that aren't in great shape across the state. Um, and I've got a little bit on there in terms of subsidy retention requirements. I'm happy to talk through. I realize that I'm at my time. Um, and then also just share, shared a real life example of a, a development that's in Jericho. The, the um, builder doesn't mind us telling uh, that story now, but um, where they were asked by the community in town to build homes that have a maximum purchase price of 343,500, but it's $370,000 to build the home. And it they've got to do, um, They've got to do two duplexes, or excuse me, two homes, one duplex of the to six total homes there have to reach that affordability level. And just to be really blunt about what this builder is faced with doing as a result of that affordability requirement, which is really well-meaning and is a great idea from the town, but we just don't have resources to step in and help um, as a state they're just gonna add that price on to those other market rate units. They're gonna throw in slightly nicer cabinets and um, countertops, and this is their quote, and they're gonna, they're gonna put the price into those market rate units and charge more for those. Um, and that, that's not the intent of that policy. That's not what we'd hope to achieve when we say to towns, <laughs> affordability, um, in, inclusionary 
um, zoning can be a great idea and a great tool for you. But yeah, so I apologize. I think I'm a minute or two over. So I want to I want to pause and see how I can help best. Please do not apologize. I feel an awful lot better informed now. Yes. If I watch this YouTube a couple times, maybe I'll finally get it in my brain. Um, so thank you. That was very, very helpful. A few questions here. Rep Fagan. Thank you. I, I have two, two questions. So thank you for coming in. And, and I agree. I'm, I'm feeling much more informed. Um, Throughout the, the presentation, you talk about uh, appraised value. And appraised value, you know, really important because that's as much as you're ever going to get a loan for from the banks, unless you are, you know, capable of. Uh, in other words, that's as much as you're going to be able to buy the house for, unless you have funding above that level to be able to to pay more for the house. So the the affordability, the the piece of appraised value is really important. And you talk about the, the concept, and I think you mentioned Jericho, one of the last things you, you discussed. Um, sure, great idea, but if those homes uh, are going to be purchased by individuals that need to take out a home loan, and the builders are on the market value units, um, uh, you know, that's where they're, they're getting their, their costs for the units that are being uh, affordably built. Um, they're, they're overlaying their costs over there. If those units don't appraise at a, at a point where someone can buy them, you know, what's happened? How is that being addressed? That's my first question. Then I just have a question that, about the $60 million you talked about, the, like the second slide you went into. But please, um, first, first, you know, how is that being addressed, the appraised piece? Sure. Yeah, so with, so just to say this aloud and and i don't want to make this the boogeyman but we've seen a 38 percent increase in the purchases that have occurred from out-of-state buyers and uh, it is safe to say that more of those out-of-state buyers are high cash borrowers so to tell a personal story um i can see a house from my um, window that was purchased in um, 2016 for one hundred and ninety five thousand um, dollars by a friend of mine and um, she put that house on the market and the realtor said, I think around 275 in 2021 is the right price for you. So she put that home on the market for 275. The home ended up appraising for 285 as negotiations started with a buyer, but they, she had multiple offers. The home ended up selling for 334 um, and the, sell, the buyer came in and just said, I can make up the gap with cash on the appraisal, I don't mind. Um, so you're absolutely right. And what's more frustrating right now is individuals who have um, government sponsored loans, USDA rural development, HUD loans, VHFA loans, and down payment assistance programs um, are less competitive in those environments because as you said, our programs just won't even allow them to, to get into that kind of trouble where they're upside down on the value of the home right away. Um, but in an overheated market and people ignoring their appraisals, that's extremely problematic. Um, so to answer your question, we do think that's really important. I want to make sure I, I think I'm answering it. We think yes. it's important to start from that point. Thank you. And then my next question is on slide three, and it's the programs to help homeowners and buyers. And you mentioned that um, a, the $60 million a year, can you speak more to where those funds are coming from? You know, how does the state of Vermont receive those funds? Sure, um, I, I would actually refer to that um, housing investment report. That's the best place to go. So the Department of Housing and Community Development aggregates all those different sources and resources. There's the HUD consolidated plan that tells HUD how we're spending our money and the, that links um, to, to, to that document, but um, it's from the federal government in the form of direct investment from HUD programs like home national housing trust fund but uh, that number also includes we receive an allotment every year of federal low income housing tax credits that then get sold and turned into equity um, for homeowner for excuse me for multifamily development primarily and so that number does include um, those resources so for example every year we get in the range of 28 to 31 thousand or 30 28 to 31 million dollars in equity from our low income housing tax credit program on the 9% credit side of things. So that gives you an idea of how those resources start stacking together. But the housing investment reports are a great resource for that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Representative Toledo. 
Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, I think, in sequence. Uh, the slide that has home, that's titled home construction fails to keep pace with demand. I don't know what slide number that is, but um, uh, so first. Um, 13. Thank you, slide 13. Um, so I had seen somewhere uh, more in an interview saying, you know, we dropped from 3,000 units a year in the 80s down to as low as 400. That doesn't quite match with this chart, although the low point in the early 2010 era, uh, post Irene, right, uh, or no, post uh, 2008 crash, um, you know, that clearly was a, a weak point. So, but it, but if if 3,000, for the sake of argument, 3,000 had been our average from the 1990 to 2020, that would be 90,000 more units. Uh, minus whatever the average has been. Let's say it's been 2,000. So let's just say it's 1,000 net a year. That's 30,000 units net. Am I right so far? I mean, like that. Oh, I mean, this is a this is a back of the envelope contextualizing question, so it doesn't have to be perfectly. But am I making sense so far? I can follow your reasoning. Yes. Okay. All right. So then. The slide doesn't say anything about what the demand curve is contextualize that. So it says fails to keep pace with demand, but the data isn't about demand. The, the data is about permits. And so I'd love to see that offset against aggregating our sense of what the demand is from the housing needs survey um, so that we're looking at those two data points together and we're understanding why there is a market failure or mismatch between demand and total housing you know, and the scale of that problem. So that's one piece of it. Then pivoting to the, I think on, on the later slide, it says 15 million for this program. And I'm understanding correctly, in order for this to be permanently affordable and therefore to be carried, sort of carried forward, we don't ever get that money back. It doesn't come back out in any format because otherwise it would defeat the purpose of um, kind of carrying forward the affordability gap subsidy. Am, am I right about that? That's correct. Yes, it's proposed to stay in the home and be passed to the next home buyer. Okay, and so then, if we if the average subsidy was fifty thousand, then that fifteen million would buy us three hundred units approximately, right? And so I'm just looking at yeah yeah, I think that's right. Three hundred units at fifty thousand would be fifteen million, I think. But somebody double check me if I'm off by an order of magnitude. <laughs> Please go on. Okay. So then I'm thinking 300 units for 15 million versus a, an accumulated gap of at least 30,000 units. And I don't under, like, I can see the value for the individual families that are in the market for housing. Totally get that. I don't understand how you can make any claims about any market impact at all. Um, and I don't see how this addresses the underlying systemic drivers that are creating this mismatch in the market. I see 16 different recommendations for systemic interventions. I see in that data report a statement that we cannot say with certainty what causal connections there are above market as an average out of that, but we think that these 16 drivers are relevant. It's not quantified how much of the gap is driven by those 16 dri you know, drivers, and there's no coherent strategy for how with this, at least in, this, in that report, I don't know where, maybe it is in the Senate policy, how we're getting at the systemic issue at the same time. So, it's, so I guess my question is comment on the relative scale of this impact versus sort of the market claims can you provide a demand curve on that slide so we understand you know has the you know over time is the gap between demand and what the market is producing increasing is it relatively stable but persistent you know what's going on sorry sure. that's a lot no that's okay um so we think about demand 
maybe a little differently. So the what we do in the housing needs assessment, and if you have the opportunity to bring that up, by all means, page six is a good one to start um, because it talks about the unmet needs in the state. And at the onset of the pandemic, is what we said is it would take about 5,800 homes, 5,800 homes in Vermont to house everyone who's experiencing homelessness to provide enough market absorption that would reduce prices down to the point that we think it would stabilize um, a high percentage of those households who are cost burden. Because, you know, in theory, if we add those units in, and I understand it is in theory, it's all, you know, until you practice it and put those units in, you don't know exactly how um, things are going to respond. Um, but in theory, if we put those in there, it should help stabilize some of those rental costs and demands too, um, if we add those units. But most of it is based off of if we provide enough homes for cost burden households to reduce some of the competition for those units that allow for the rents um, and or the prices um, being charged by the owners um, to be to, to reduce some of the pressure on that. So that would be what I would point to um, and and relation to your question about market numbers. Um, and just to be clear, the affordable housing resources, you know, I like to say that we can produce about 200 units in an average year. Like that's that's about the best I think we can do with our year over year resources that we have. Um, and the ex, you know, there's a lot, I could go into how a development pipeline in the state responds to the availability of funding resources. Um, but that's that's a safe bet for me. Um, and when we added the one-time pandemic resources, if you take that 5,800 homes that we were trying to get to, if we drop those in alongside our existing resources in the five-year period, which is what that 5,800 homes was saying in five years, we need to get there. It would get us about, you know, roughly, um, I think it's about 30% of the way there. But that's the affordable housing resources. We have to believe and trust that the market will also produce um, some units as well. That's the idea is that there will also be market rate units coming online. It's not all going to be affordable housing development, although in some communities that is the new stuff that gets built. That's a reality that we deal with. So um, I guess that's the starting point on the demand side of things. In regards to the question of how are we getting at the systemic issues, we don't control the major systemic issues. Um, we can talk about permitting and land use regulations and the impact that and the trade-offs that we have as a state about um, conservation and what that means for the predictability timeline of a builder and how confident they are that they're gonna get a, a project through permitting. And we look at the difference between applications for permits and actual starts. And right now that number is more mismatched than it usually is. Um, but it's a good sign that builders are dreaming big and pulling permits. It's not a great sign that the pull through rate in terms of the completion certificates for occupancy um, aren't at the same level. Um, and that's a sign though, not just of regulatory and uh, land use barriers, but also just of construction price increases. I, we've just seen exorbitant increases. Um, we had a 10% increase last year um, in our, um, in our uh, rental housing development pipeline. And this year we're looking at potentially a 20% increase. And I don't need to explain to you all that our resources at the same time haven't grown by that much from the federal government to build house, affordable housing, right? So we're, you know, we're scrambling to try to find ways to deal with those cost increases. And then, you know, I encourage you to talk to Naylor and Breen. It's a, they're, they're a great one to talk about this topic or Jim Bradley at the Home Builders Association who will explain to you that builders can't hire people right now. Um, they're having a really hard time doing that. And the thing that they point to kind of ironically and cyclically is that the builders and tradespeople that they need can't afford to live here and are having trouble finding homes. So we do think that some of these homes would fill that range. And if you talk to builders, $25 an hour and lower is where they are having the hardest time um, and most difficult time. And we think we could we could hopefully get at that in, in some ways on here. It doesn't solve all the problems and we don't control all the labor uh, me mechanisms, and we certainly don't on the supply side of um, of materials. Uh, but just two follow up things. Uh, one is a statement. Totally understand. It's not your responsibility to solve the systemic issues. It's ours. Um, and so, I what I my point was really, I want to make sure as we look at 
what the Senate policy is, and we're addressing that there, you know, that there's lots of questions, but there's clear performance gaps. Um, just a clarifying question. The housing needs assessment 5,800 units is for affordable housing, but the permit slide is for all permits, not affordable housing permits, right? The um, 5,800 is, um, is total housing stock. So that's looking at all units actually. Like that's the number that okay. we, we set out for the and state is that, not. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off, sorry. Go ahead, finish your sentence. And the permit slide is for all homes as well. Okay, and then, but that 5,800 is pre-pandemic when we see being, we've seen a real estate spike, you know, throughout the state of, of people buying second homes which it you know, came out of, virtually came out of nowhere and has been a huge force on the market. Um, and so how much, is there anywhere that we're starting to quantify the impact of, the, of that sort of pandemic purchase cycle on those projections? We are, but what I would say to you is, is um, we're, we're just starting. So when I gave a presentation yesterday to the um, House Natural um, resources committee about this topic. Um, and we do have, you know, quite a bit to say about where things are in terms of building and, and household um, sizes and where workers are. Um, but it's too soon to say like what the long-term impacts of, the, of those are going to be. So we keep some pandemic indicators for housing on the, on our website. And then we recently, I think it was around March the 6th, um, took apart the state's transfer um, tax data from last year and compared it to several other years to try to get at that while also looking at the current home sales data and put together an article that I won't try to summarize here, but is pretty good at, at giving our best guesses at what we think the defined pandemic impacts are and what the potential long-term ramifications for prices and costs are. Is that um, something that you would be willing to send along to the committee? Sure, happy to. Or at least yeah. to me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Feltis? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, I thank you for these concrete examples you gave us at the end of the presentation. It makes more sense to me that way. But on the very last one, I'm struck where you actually point out that this that there's still a gap because this number of the, the maximum purchase price doesn't include the builder's profit or his other soft costs. And how would those costs be covered? Uh, and how would they be covered? Would they be yeah. for another purchase price, a higher purchase price? Or is there an agreement that somehow the builder would be subsidized? Sure. Yeah, so um, this was a rough budget um, from a, a builder who um, I will say would make their money off of what I would call vertical integration, meaning, uh, or um, what some people might say is uh, conditions, meaning that they are they are in realizing revenue from building the larger home. So they don't think about it in builder's profit. The budget analysis that we've built for the program though is actually gonna ask builders to do that and sign off on a, on a cap um, across all the building process um, of what their um, gross earnings would be at the end. So I think the, the point I was making is I don't actually think they can build that home for $370,000. I think probably when they put their profit on there, as you're saying, it's probably you know more than the 390s or something like that. I think there's a bigger problem there than even the builder was acknowledging. My, my concern would be certainly that even even builders who who are sympathetic to this whole concept and are being willing to offer a you know a very modest profit in order to do this, it would still be difficult to do that um, without covering some of their costs. Certainly. Yes. And the other question I had was, I understand the subsidy stays with the program and it needs to be continued on to the next um, homeowner. But what if these homes don't turn over very quickly? Do you mean that the um, individuals stay in them for a long time? Right, right. The individual has a great deal and they're going to stay there for 10 years. We think that's a great outcome, frankly. Like uh, that's that's the ideal outcome. We get, um, I think people get more uneasy when they think about the idea that, um, you know, there's an opportunity for people to uh, realize appreciation and equity from sales 
Um, and that's why keeping the affordability um, portion of the subsidy in the home or getting recaptured back to the program to you know, do another home with um, was key. Um, so we think that people staying would be a good thing. And we um, prescribe and subscribe to perpetual affordability as an organization. Um, so it's, it's something that we usually strive for in, in all of our investments too. So as much as we can create you know, cornerstones of affordability in communities. We think that that's a good thing. Um, but the, the difference between traditional shared equity is that it promises to sell the home to an AMI level that's subsidized later on. That subsidy is created by the seller sharing their equity as part of that transaction. Um, and this program is not prescribing that that's a requirement to do that. And as I explained, we think that um, having optionality for multiple right solutions to that problem is a good idea. Um, and especially as we look outside Chittenden County. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Leonard, the, I, I'd like to, this is Mary Hooper again. Um, I'd like to go back to the kind of the systemic issue that Rep Tolino was raising. And it strikes me to say this very inartfully, that our housing partners in the state are absolutely terrific at what, what they're doing and the creation of the programs that they've created. I mean, I, I think every one of our communities has been transformed by the financing that you've helped with, by the and then the local housing agencies who figured out how to make it work. But that's, it, it, you know, that's only getting at, it, it, in current terms, only getting at 30% of the problem uh, over, over this five year period. And I'm just fearful that we're going to look back and say, oh my gosh, we still haven't solved it. And it strikes me that in fact, it is on the, um, where we haven't been as smart is figuring out how to help communities either lay down the infrastructure necessary to create, be it zoning or be it the physical infrastructure necessary for housing to be developed more affordably. Um, arguably, we could, if we underwrote permit costs, if, if we took the same amount of money and applied it to permit costs, that would take probably 30 million, 30,000 off of each home cost. Um, so I'm, you all are really good at the housing development side, but I don't think we're as good on some of the other sides. And can you kind of help? And so one of the things I'm thinking of is we have lots of investments in water and sewer. If, if we were laying out in designated downtowns, expanding our water and sewer and laying out a road system like we did in the 50s or 60s in other parts of the, of the country, you could build affordable homes. If we underwrote the permit costs, you could build more affordable homes. Can you help us think about that or help me think about that? Sure. Um, so I have a, a, a little cycle I always call the, it's the capital absorption sort of cycle of the way things work um, for how housing development pipeline gets built. And it starts with need um, and there being a demand for homes, knowing that if you build that home, somebody will buy it or somebody needs to live in it. Even as a nonprofit developer, if you're building subsidized units, you need to know that the area has need and that people will occupy those homes. That has not been a problem in Vermont. We have never had a, a loan or a property in our portfolio um, uh, default um, in the traditional sense um, and because of you know, lack of people to live there and need. Um, the second thing is the availability of capital and the capital that has come via ARPA, the capital that's come from the housing revenue bond in the past, those, those tell developers and builders that there's resources for me to use and I need to amp up my efforts to build a pipeline. Um, and then they build capacity internally and we see additions to staff happening right now to people to keep up with the current ARPA money. 
But I think what you're getting at is this next piece, which is development really thrives off of predictability and process and timelines. And so if I were to take a, a development budget for you for a single family or multifamily home, I would guess that the permitting costs are actually only about 9%. And I can say that definitively on the multifamily side, it's 9% of the average development that we do. So you could take that cost away, but when units on the multifamily side are costing us now um, 368,000 per unit to build, um, that 9% isn't a huge, isn't a huge number. What the builders or developers would tell you is that it's the oper it's the cost of uncertainty that happens when there's unclear local process to how their development gets approved and what opposition and obstacles might cause in terms of time and cost delays. So they would point to places where they're just like, it, I couldn't take the risk. I, it wasn't, I, I couldn't see clearly enough through the fog to start putting money into this thing to really make it move. Um, and a lot of it, um, when you talk to builders and developers of that, um, starts with those regulatory and permitting processes. So that is absolutely part of the, the entire cycle. What gets me excited about 226 and we've been vocal about is we align our investments typically with the state's designation programs and try to achieve our community development land use regulatory goals as a state, not just thinking about housing, but land use patterns and settlement patterns overall. Um, and the bill does have a lot of really good um, enhancements and investments in improving and evolving the state's designation program, providing uh, municipal planning grants so that communities can get pressed um, in some cases to doing the right thing when it comes to allowing housing appropriate density um, so that we do build build homes in the right places because we're talking about the numbers here today about how many units we need to produce. But when I go and um, have conversations with natural and um, conservation um, folks, there's a lot of you know equally balanced concern where it's like, where are all those units gonna go? And are we gonna be sure that they go the right places? And I think that's really married to the systemic issues that you're talking about there. And I do feel like, and Chris Cochran's a great person, Jacob Hemrick, to speak to that, that there are some good provisions in this bill to help with that, those issues. Thank you. Um, let me do a follow up and then we have another question. If I heard you correctly, the permitting costs are on the order of about, or the development costs are on the order of about 9% of a project cost. And I think you said, that's not a lot, um, and I can appreciate that in, in, in construction world, that's probably a normal number, but it's also over, in, in, it's more than the value gap, and it's what, two thirds of the affordability gap, if that went away, what you were trying to finance would be entirely different. But, yeah, and I, I, I want to correct myself there because 9% is actually the soft cost bundle that actually also includes architectural and design. Oh, and I, I should have quantified that because when you talk to a builder, that's the number we focus on when it comes to permitting because a lot of the expenses associated with permitting adjustments actually show up in architecture and design adjustments. Okay. Um, so it is a, I will, I should have said it's a bundle of services because you're totally right. The, the permitting line item is a percentage of that 9%. That was okay. kind of flawlessly stated. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. And, and I've always heard about 10% for, you know, the total soft costs. That makes sense now. Representative Iacovani. A couple of questions, a follow up, and this has been helpful. Um, out of that, the $60 million tax credits, do you know how much of that comes from the Vermont Treasury? So, so from um, a, a state basis, I'm gonna quote the total. I, I will write back with the exact breakdown of the state credits between rental and home ownership. Um, I've got too many numbers in my head this week, I apologize. Um, but the state provides an affordable housing tax credit um, that's on a much lesser magnitude and, and percentage than the federal program. So the, um, the state program um, creates a couple million dollars in total equity every year um, for homeownership and rental development, where the federal programs pre create a couple tens of millions of dollars every year 
um, for development. Thank you. And then I wanted to go back to the manufactured homes. Um, there are some very nice uh, manufactured homes, certainly in my community. Um, I live in one, it's very nice. Um, but I'm wondering that market, isn't it much less than the, to, to, to build than the 300,000 range that you speak of? We do see that as an affordable path for home ownership. There's, yes, uh, just the quick answer is absolutely. They have gotten quite a bit more expensive recently. It'll surprise, especially when you get into energy efficiency, but yes. I would, I'm just curious why we wouldn't, in a period where, you know, land, labor, and materials, the three drivers, the housing, are all at high peaks, maybe you, you don't fight that fight and you, you go into a different area. And I realize not everyone wants uh, that type of house, but for many it's adequate. I'm, I'm just wondering why wouldn't we go there? I know you have, I read the material, almost five, 600 units over the last uh, two years. Any, any thought, insights on that? Yes, and so this this proposal is also paired in in the 226 bill with a manufactured home community investment um, opportunity that combines a couple different things. The first is small scale capital needs to help with things that state um, programs aren't picking up with for the communities themselves. And um, Representative, I, I think one of the items you're pointing out is we have lots that are inactive right now that could be active in communities. Um, so from a manufactured home community standpoint, it could help um, clean up those lots, remove abandoned and dilapidated homes, and help put um, together foundations that will then enable the next homeowner to access that, that lot with greater ease and potentially use the state's down payment assistance program at the same time. Um, and included in that bill is an expansion of the down payment assistance program for the manufactured home replacement that could also be used outside of lots on owned land uh, by individuals uh, throughout the state as well. So that is, that's part of the total package for us 226. Yeah. So um, I, I realize when we talk about our housing portfolio, it's huge and this is but one segment, everything from section eight, all the different programs that we have. Um, you know, if, if I were to say, can you show me uh, the distribution of our portfolio? Is there anyone who could do that? And behind my question is, I was at a housing uh, conference last night. Um, the family that my wife is working with that's uh, being evicted on Monday. And um, I think the data said there were 500 children in motels. So my mind goes towards, do you take care of the children's need first, don't you? you? You mitigate that in a significant way before you start talking about home equity, which is very important. I don't deny that at all. And is that Vermont's policy? Should it be Vermont's policy? To first go after the, what I call the emergency situations and then once that's tamped down, whatever the terminology you want to use, then you address the others, or is it such that you have to multitask, you just can't do one? Any insights on that? Sure. Yeah, so first of all, just from a statewide perspective, we, we say there are 13,900 total government subsidized um, units um, for apartments on the rental side of things statewide, and that includes um, you know, VHFA has a portion of those in the tax credit program. Those also include private owners who have um, portable voucher holders living in their units or rental assistance from the state housing authority. Um, it also includes um, affordable housing built through USDA rural development and our public housing authorities, which might not be in our, our quote unquote portfolio from we funded it with tax credits or some other kind of thing, but it is part of the total universe. And so we keep track on that on housingdata.org. So if you ever like to like to see the kind of breakdown, we try to do that um, on that site with various um, views. So let me know if you've got specific questions, but we can absolutely break things down for you about 
apartments and how many homes have been created and things like that with the programs. Um, I do think we're multitasking and I think you all have approved some incredibly substantial and very much appreciated investments um, in one-time spending for rental housing development and that we have prioritized that funding um, towards creating units for those in the most urgent need um, in homeless households. And we work very closely with the agency Human Services. Most of those projects that are being done with the funding you put through VHCB um, from ARPA and one-time funding also are using tax credit programs. So we're all working together um, to get those units built. Um, and that all those developers and builders right now are running as fast as they can um, to, to get as many units online as quick as they can with those resources that are so critically needed to provide that emergency housing and, and make sure people start off with a safe, decent home to live in. And you're right that that is always first and foremost our priority is that that should be something everyone expects to have the opportunity to, to be able to have a safe home, a safe, decent home. Um, so we do start there. We do think, though, that this is part of the market that deserves attention um, and that you know, as, as time goes on, um, home ownership has really positive net benefits. Um, Habitat for Humanity is a great entity if you've got time to hear from people to talk about the benefits of the owners of their program, uh, which this could be combined with. Um, it, it's, it's incredible what can happen to people with that tool um, as well. So... We, we want to do all of that, um, and we think that this is appropriately sized given what we're what we're doing on the rental side too. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. I don't want to trespass on your time anymore. I personally found this tremendously helpful in understanding this, and so we're really grateful for you taking more than an hour, way more than an hour with us. So yeah. And we look forward to watching watching good things happen with these investments. Yeah. So, well, I appreciate thank all you. your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Us. Yeah. Honored to join you. Thank you. Hope you all have a great day. Good luck with the water bottles, too. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to go searching. Um, okay, committee, we're next back in here at 1 o'clock. Um, I looked it up, and now I have forgotten again. <clears throat> The um, Justin Kinney on, on performance and government accountability, that, that, that conversation. So we're back here at one, Matt, and then we are on the floor at three. Um, so with that, you want to take us off live? Okay, and you have a two o'clock with Matt there. Oh, that's right. So and then two o'clock with Matt Barrowitz from the Department of Labor. So we'll probably be good. Yeah. Thank you.